Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, se, mi, do. It's already on, don't worry. <laughs> From very early on in my life, whenever I was whistling, I was always, as a kid, I was always... <laughs> and every time I would know where my mother and my sisters are in the house because I was like, Heiko, stop it! Hey, hello everybody. We are already talking to Heiko from Resourceful Humans. Uh, hey, Heiko. Pleasure to be here virtually with you guys. Nice to have you. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you remember that Heiko was already on the HR Fest stage. I believe it was the first HR Fest or something like that. So yeah. since then, we grew pretty big. Uh, we are now the largest in Hungary uh, this year, hopefully. <laughs> depending on COVID, we meet 7,000 people. So we are very ha happy and thankful for your first appearance. Helped us a lot. So hey, resource for humans first. T tell us, what is that? You know, now you're bringing back all the memories because I, I remember that I, Budapest for me was a complete white spot on the map. But uh, back in the day, I was working at a, at a computer games company, Crytek, and they had an office in Hungary, um, but it was always it was always so crazy intense that it was flying in, uh, getting to the office, flying out, and I never saw anything of Budapest. So first time I came to the HR Fest, I actually said, I'm going to take some days and look at Budapest. And it is such a beautiful city. I was really, I really fell in love. I, at the time, I remember thinking it was like the old grandmother of, uh, of Paris. You know, it, it looked like a little bit. But so I did, the Budapest always had a special connection to Resourceful Humans because the idea of Resourceful Humans was really born in the video games industry for me and what we did there. The idea was that classical HR was not suited very well to a company that was completely agile and so fast paced as the video, industry, video games industry. You couldn't keep up, you know, in the normal quarterly performance reviews in a two week sprint cycle. It's all nonsense, right? So. Basically, what we said was we throw everything we know about HR out of the window and we recreate um, a function to say, what would it feel like? What would it be like? What would we act like if we wanted to create an environment where people could just create extremely good products with minimum bureaucracy and minimum bullshit in their way to do it? And we built a department up from that from that experience side, we said we, we basically say we have an end product in, in mind, which is everybody can do a great job. Whatever we have to do for that, we will do it and we will reinvent it. And in the end, what happened was we didn't need HR at all. It was uh, basically the best HR was no need for HR. We just gave the organization the ability to self-organize and then we sort of slowly exited uh, through the rear and said, mission done, new things. And then we founded our own company and because it was so successful, we called it Resourceful Humans. So. Nice, nice, and we love that. HRFest is basically founded on this, the, um, along the same principles. We hate bullshit and we hate posing and we hate uh, stupid company internal games. So it's nice to hear. And hey, in the last two months, basically, something similar happened around the world, no? How do you see that? What happened? I was gone. What, anything yeah, happen? Small, some small nothing. It's just uh, some little small animals. <laughs> some small animals. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, for me, it's funny because now people are coming and they're, they're talking to me about, oh, radical and disruptive change. You know, before radical change and disruption, they were bullshit bingo buzzwords to sell you shit. But nobody really felt disrupted. You know, it's, it's just it was nonsense. Um, and I remember, even if, you, if I look in my mails now from three months ago or something, where with our biggest clients, you know, you had these huge fights with HR and the workers' council about make, make a test balloon, let the people work from home two days a week. Let's just, let's just try it. Let's be crazy. You know, and they're like, no, I don't think it'll work. And then we need to see them. And, and then, oh, look, it works. 100% working from home. Did the sky fall? No, it didn't. No, but, it, I, I think it just shows you that these disruptive events, they, they push the limit of what is possible because you don't get a choice anymore if you're going out of your comfort zone or not. It's, there, there it is. Have fun, you know, and now deal with it. And human beings are very resilient and adaptive. We can always make it work, though. I have to say it's, it is a challenge, but 
it, it, it shows that um, real disruption brings out uh, the real creativity in people to overcome the disruption and, and deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. I call it as, as, um, the moment of truth because, you know, everybody had all these nice slogans and uh, company mottos and uh, whatever, and everybody was supportive and agile and free thinking and innovative. Oh, yeah. and, but and, and, office, and award winning offices, you know, but in reality, uh, now you can see which company culture is really agile and, uh, and which manager is agile. So what do you well, think? And, and, yeah. and I think the, the most important thing is that you will separate. You know, I always said we will really find out how good Google is when Google gets under threat or competition or something like this. I think now all those methods and systems are stress tested. And I think that you can really separate the bullshit from the, the companies that really work because agile doesn't mean anything. Agile is just a method. You know, it might be a method that helps you or it might not help you. But at the end of the day, it's about is your culture sound? Are, are your people uh, invested in your, in your mission, in your company? And do they want to make it work? If they want to make it work, they will find ways to make it work. If they don't want to make it work, no agile, no design thinking, no Lego serious play, no virtual reality, no nothing will help you, right? So, in, and I think all this disruption cuts through the bullshit of, yeah, I need to sell this tool or this method to, at, at, at the core, do we believe in what we're doing? And do I believe I want to do it with the people around me? Because then I will fight to make it work and survive. And that's the question that people and companies face in those moments of truth. And what do you think? Because people are people. So it was one, one uh, okay, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of um, struggle and, uh, and terrible stuff happened. So let's not look at it as uh, uh, something good, but still looking at from this perspective, it was, it was a boost. But how much, yeah. how, much is going to, how much is going to stick? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I was just asked to write an essay for for a society that I contributed a chapter in a book in and um, it was the same question. I think it, it, it will be an illusion to think that now everybody's mind has been magically opened and now we're going to do whatever we want. I mean, you see there are some things happening like the big companies like Facebook and stuff. They're saying now you can work from anywhere now. It's basically, you've established a new norm. Um, I think it is as usual with the pendulums, you know, they swing one way extremely, then they swing the other way extremely. I, I think that we will not arrive in a completely new normal. I think for a few people, the minds will have been open to new possibilities. They will see what's, what's good and, and what, what's possible. But I, I don't think there'll be a radical shift as soon as we can go back to, to, to normal because the old patterns are just too ingrained in the system. But I think what we're seeing is a, a bigger step forward than if it had not happened, right? I mean, look at it, it's like the same thing as with a world war, right? I mean, it's not like after the world war, we learned our lesson and there never was a, a war again, neither did we learn it after the second world war, but it became less and less war. It became more and more peaceful, right? And I think the same we're happening now. I think this was an acceleration. Um, it'll be an, an extreme acceleration for some uh, parts of the economy but not, not, not super drastic, I, I don't think. I think what it will happen, and that is necessary, what you're also seeing is a slowdown also in the crazy investment um, cycles that we've had and that companies who really were completely overvalued but didn't really have a business plan and got billions thrown at them, there, there was some normalization happening there. And I think that was healthy and helpful and just a realization of normal again but we will also get back into crazy I'm, I'm sure but it was a good wake-up call i think absolutely you know what i was thinking when i was uh, preparing for uh, the discussion that, that uh, i like a lot the name resourceful humans because it uh, for me it's a bit also it also means that in every company there are resourceful humans and probably even in the most traditional non-agile you know bullshit ridden company with strong personalities. Uh, what happened in the last two months is that there were some great guys, girls, who solved issues that were previously thought absolutely unsolvable. And they solved it in, you know, two days. 
But the question is, and, and they kind of like, you know, it, it's almost like they defeated bureaucracy for this, these two months. But, but what will happen next? So will, will, will bureaucracy fight back? Or how do you see, how can, how can uh, a few resourceful humans make a change in a company which is, which is ridden with bureaucracy? Yeah, I think, you know, bureaucracy is like a rubber band, you know? It's like, I think in these situations like now, you have these people who are stretching them, you know, who are you're taking them to the, to the limit, but then slowly they snap back, yeah. um, un unfortunately. And that is the frustrating part for uh, people who have gone beyond the limits because it's, it's like what we're doing here with, with peer commitments. I think like the, the biggest step that we took in our own company and what we're helping with other companies with is to say, rather than work in a hierarchy where somebody tells you what to do, we tell you very clearly what the company is about and, and what resources we have. And then you have to peer commit. You have to find people who will work with you on something. And that'll basically tell you if you're going the right direction. Once you've gone that far, it's very hard to go back into a job where people tell you what to do because you've been educated to think through it yourself like an adult and to talk to other people like adults and, and establish that, that level of commitment between people without somebody telling you what to do. Just like when you move out from home at some point, you don't want your mom and your dad to tell you anymore what you should do because you're not an adult. It's hard to go back and, and you can endure your parents for the weekends and for the vacation, but you know, it's very hard when your mom still tries to tell you what to do. So and I think it's the same with bureaucracy, right? Is that bureaucracy is an established set of rules and procedures that are trying to maintain a status quo. Then something comes along, which is a complete mismatch with the status quo, and you have these people who are comfortable or competent enough to go outside of it and say, we'll deal with it outside the norm. And suddenly the norm comes back and the, the disruption is over and they want to get you back in and say, hey, back to compliance and uh, line of sight and all that uh, nonsense, right? And you will have, these people will be very frustrated because if it was possible, we could work from home. Why do I have to sit in an office again? You know, it was possible that we did this amongst ourselves. Why do I have to run the reports again now? And stuff like that. So. I think there will be a lot of frustration um, for these people. And you might see another wave of people actually trying and founding their own companies. And um, also what I think you will see is now you will see a much clearer case also for these network organizations that are really trying to go beyond hierarchies. But bureaucracy, yeah, it's like, it's like a rubber band. I think it, it comes back and it snaps back and it hits you in the head and it hurts. Absolutely, yeah. You know, another uh, bullshit word is the uh, future of work. Everything is the future of work. You know, it's like a magical yeah. uh, solution. But now, now, now basically, it, it is really time, or uh, at least we have a chance to completely redefine work, or at least start moving. And yes, yeah, so what do you think? What, what is going to be the, the, the future of work in, in 10 years, like, or whatever? It, is it going to be much more gig economy, or... Or, or how do you see it? Uh, you know, I, I'm unfortunately sitting in the wrong room. I'm sitting in my office in, the, in our big meeting room. We have a, a DeLorean parked in the middle of the office. You know, the, I have a little model here, you know, the, 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 the back to the future car. That's cool. It's my, my favorite line when I start talking about our age and what we do is that this whole future of work, I never really understood because, I mean, we are referencing back to companies from 1939 and 1950s who've done all this kind of stuff for a long time. There's nothing new, right, about what, what we believe is the future of work. So the, the future is already here. It's just very unevenly distributed, right? And the question is rather, why is there so much past of the work still here in the present um, where the future is clearly proven that it's the better model? But that, that again, I think that's where we're just on the line. So future of work for me is a very abstract term that I always had problems with. At the end of the day, I don't think pe people are not so much into this gig economy because it also has this notion of being freelance on your own. Um, and I think two things people don't like is they don't like being on their own. They like being in tribes. They like being in a community and they want to have a level of uh, financial safety. They, they don't want to have to worry all the time. What will be next month? Can I make rent? Can, can I afford my daughter's private school or something like this? You know, 
um, I think that everybody going gig economy is not something that people desire, nor do I think it is desirable because I think we see that a lot of those platforms that are providing the gig economy also try to really exploit their people and don't really have an interest in the community working. I mean, we saw this with, with Uber and all these companies who try to really squeeze the lemon hard because some investors said we need a, a bigger dividend or something like that. You know? So I think people are rightly skeptical of what the gig economy is right now. However, I think there are elements of what the gig economy is using, which is direct transactions between people, which we're, we, we will see much more of. And I think this was in part a lesson from the disruption from COVID-19 now that you couldn't centrally control everything because it was just impossible. So you had to rely more on people making direct connections um, and rather than investing in direct control, investing in a much higher level of clarity of what is it that we're trying to achieve and the competency of the people followed to actually get it done between themselves. So I think that part of the gig economy got a huge boost, right? This direct transactional peer-to-peer -peer part, but not, not the, the element of uh, let's all be freelancers. I, don't, I understand that. Interesting, exciting. And, and so I know it's also, might sound like a bullshit question, but so what's the future of HR? And, and, and now let's, let's not think about, let's think specifically in a, to, to, the, to the, the role of an HR manager in a, in a medium to large size com company. So not a, a sexy startup or anything like that, like, you know, a telecom in Hungary or uh, let's not name names, but you know, a, a few thousand people or a thousand plus people, hierarchy, 100 years old firm, you are the HR director. So what you should do? Yeah, interesting times. Huh? I mean, this is the, uh, for me, I, the analogy that I had in my mind when we were going into this and you had, you know, if, the interesting thing was you could see how all the countries responded to this threat differently. Right, and uh, do you know this book, um, World War Z, that, that they made a movie out of with Brad Pitt? Oh yeah, I do. It's, yeah, the movie's awful, but the yeah, book is sorry. awesome. It, it, yeah, the, it's really it's a good book. The, the guy said basically he just took zombies as a as an example of the zombie apocalypse, as the world is faced with something highly disruptive that every country has to respond to, and every country responded differently you know like germany rolled over because we didn't want to go to war the americans attacked and whatever you know um but in in, in reading this book and, and then i i looked at the the precursors to COVID 19 which was sars and mers and they said that uh, if we had taken those outbreaks the regional outbreaks in asia more serious with sars and we had continued the scientific investigation so many deaths could have been prevented for COVID-19. But the moment the threat level decreases, the funding decreases, right? So only when the threat exponentially rises, suddenly we throw resources in. Um, and I think what HR has had a really bad time with historically is thinking ahead. What might be the thing that might face our organization next? We're usually really good with either looking at the past and trying to best practice share what happened before or to work with what's right in front of our noses and recruit, 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 or, or, or whatever challenge we just got thrown from the board. But to be the guys who said, you know what, we, we've established our own early warning system. We've looked at all the different environmental factors around this organization. And we think we have three big risk factors that are coming towards us, likelihood ranging from zero to hundred percent. And we'd like to prepare for those looking forward. If you ask CHROs today, I, very few, I'd say maybe 5% of them can immediately tell you, I, I'll give you our three that we have to prepare for. And we're actively taking steps to prepare the organization for this, that, and this. Most of them are like, wow, we're so, it, right now it's crazy because we have uh, organizational change, business process reengineering, blah, 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 blah. But nobody is looking over the event horizon, right? Um, so what exactly it might be, who knows, yeah, but to actually start tackling those and to sit down with your team and to take the time and deliberately think about 
is this function still suited in the way that it's structured and how we operate ourselves as HR for the challenges that are facing our organization tomorrow? Could we potentially be a role model as HR for what's coming next? You know, like how long did it take HR to catch on to Agile and just try it out, you know, for, for heaven's sake, just do it. If you don't like it, then don't do it. Then you can at least go back to the business and say, we tried this Agile thing. It didn't work. But first, you know, it's avoidance, then fighting it. And in the end, after everybody has done it, HR says, oh, now we're also doing Agile. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that those are the questions that HR has to really tackle more seriously if they want to be a strategic function and not constantly say, hey, they want to sit at the big boy table and take us seriously. Well, then do something to be taken seriously, which is, make spreadsheets not powerpoints about you know these are the financial implications of our company and here are the threats and what might they cost us what will they benefit us if if we do this um and then work out scenarios and go back to the board and say this is what we want to actually do and it's very likely that they will look different for all sorts of companies as you say you know for a startup this might be a very different threat than for a small to medium-sized business or for a corporate um in general you know i'm i'm an advocate for there will be a, a much bigger push towards a different organizational model. So away from the command and control and the hierarchy towards a more direct transactional peer-to-peer -peer network organization. And I think, again, very few HR departments are actively testing that and saying, might agree or disagree, whoever cares, let's do it scientifically, let's try it out and let's see what our experience is with it, right? Because I think what you've seen now, especially in this disruption with um, coronavirus, is that these companies who have been down the path of trying to heavily decentralize and distribute their decision-making process were much more resilient and adaptive in dealing with this crisis. So they have the financial data now to say, this worked. We, we were better prepared for this. We didn't specifically prepare for this pandemic. Well, pre we prepared for the unknown unknown. So we gave a lot of transactional power to our people to solve problems at the point of impact. They didn't have to go back and ask for approval over approval over approval over approval, but they could deal with the problem at, at, at hand with their own authority because we'd invested in clear frameworks, the, the, the actual processes so people could make decisions and they felt comfortable with them. They were competent enough to take the decisions. And I, I really believe that's where it's gonna go to, right? A, a more self-designed organization. And that's where HR should go. That's, I think HR really needs to be much more of a prototype for this entrepreneurial organization. And still, relatively few HR departments across the board. If you ask anybody in HR and say, give me the numbers, what's the share price? What do you cost right now? How do you, what value do you add? You know, they don't have answers and they need to have answers. If you want to be taken seriously in an entrepreneurial context, you need not only to deal in the soft, but also in the hard. And you need to be the, the, the people who can do both. You be the bridge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the difficulty for them is, I think, that they are part of the bureaucracy. And, you know, bureaucracy is, is, is not something you can touch. It's, it's people. And, and if you start, uh, start uh, killing the barriers and start empowering the, the, the employees, that's actually goes against those who are in power. So it's, it's a really a difficult dance, you know, to, to survive and reform the company. I mean, I, I told you that we've, we've created this virtual reality simulation, right? Where a lot of the companies, especially the larger ones, as, as you mentioned, you know, who are most successful ones, but also the biggest ones with the biggest bureaucracies have the hardest time to actually make a, a step forward at scale, not, not individual departments. You often have one department that is super ultra fancy ahead of the curve, but in general, the, the overall, how we organize power, work, and, and money is, is usually a fixed process that some break out of, but not the overall company. So what we've done is we've taken the un, unlikeliest case where you know some of those leaders usually are 50 plus upwards and they are still have a little bit of a military mindset. So they, they've done their, their military service and they say, hey, you know, all this bullshit with this, this new agile. And it's, at the end of the day, the captain needs to tell the guys what to do and it works in the military and it should work here as well. I know the Harvard Business Review said I should now be 
a democratic leader or something like that. But they don't really believe, right? They, 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 they really believe in their heart of hearts that a good storm makes a good cap, right? And so we worked with this submarine captain with David Marquet, who had actually done sort of the opposite, right? And he said, you know what? The, the, the best examples even in the military are now, my job as a captain is to create an environment where people can make great decisions. Because if I have to constantly make great decisions and God beware, I get killed um, on the submarine and then my guys say, what, okay, we go back home because we've lost our captain. Or you actually need to prepare the crew to a point where they can make great decisions without the captain. The captain's there to establish the clarity about the mission and to help them make good decisions. But, um, and, and sometimes also be disruptive and, and have a hard call. But um, at the end of the day, it shouldn't all depend on the captain. So we created a virtual reality simulation out of this where people actually have to drive the submarine. And in, in the game, they experience what is the difference between um, driving a submarine where everybody just waits for you to give them orders or you empower the crew to take decisions yourself. And it's like a frog in boiling water that the missions become increasingly complex and fast to a point where command and control hits a limit. You can't be that fast. And suddenly you constantly, you're frustrated because you get sunk. You, you, you can't solve the mission. And then people in the game starts realizing, I need to change something about my behavior. Maybe I let the, the, the navigator make the decisions by themselves. Maybe the weapons guy can also decide by himself. And then they come out of the game and they haven't been taught anything, right? But they suddenly have questions. Why did this work? Why did this not work? So they've, they've, they're challenging their own paradigms. And then you can actually engage with them because you've, you've hit an emotional nerve. They didn't want to fail, but they failed, right? Um, and and this, this emotion is the part where you can start building learning upon. And I think in the past, we've built too much on the head and we tried to convince people with facts. Now we're actually trying to go straight for the heart and say, play the game. And after the game, you'll come back and you'll have questions and we'll try to work on those. And what we've seen is that when what we do is that they play the game and then we translate the lessons from the game into their operational reality. And when we do this with the HR departments and the, the CHROs, and they go through this, especially when the, the managing directors and the CEO have been through the simulation before. And then we say, look, when did the submarine work best? Well, when people had clarity about the mission and about their roles and the rules of engagement and how to work between them. Okay, so let's try to translate that into your operational reality. Are you extremely clear about what the value proposition of your organization is? Are you clear what your value to that is? And are people clear on what they contribute to it? No, right? And you're like, okay, so what are you doing all day long? Well, mostly we're dealing with the fact that we're not very clear about it. So a lot of our energy is taking up either in trying to establish clarity about something that's not there or in trying to come up with new rules to get around the fact that we're not very clear about what we're doing, which creates more bureaucracy and more bullshit, right? And I think that's exactly where HR needs to become more self-aware to say, why don't we push our board, our CEO, to be more clear about this so people can work more autonomously? Do we really have clarity or are we dancing around the issue a lot? Because then you can say we can throw 95% of those rules and processes that we have that are preoccupied with keeping something intact because it's unclear or because it's based on people's egos bashing because they don't exactly know which way to go. So they just want to make it work for themselves. And we establish that clarity and we can take out all these bullshit processes. But for that, you'd actually have to be in a position to be A, taken seriously. So you, you can be the person and the department that can push for that clarity. And you need to ask the right questions. So you need to understand the business very well to be asked those questions. And that's again, where we're hitting usually a snag in HR that we don't, we're not the guys who can ask pinpointed question about the supply chain management problems that we have because we don't understand the supply chain management of the company, right? So we need to be extremely good entrepreneurs and we need to be extremely savvy about the business model that we're operating in to understand what impact it has on the soft side of the business. Sounds good. Right, doesn't it? But, yeah, yeah. It does. I think that we are quite proud of uh, in HR Fest is that among the, those coming to our events, I cannot say everybody is like that already, but there are a large number of HR directors in Hungary, those who I know, who are 
are, are, are starting to have this mindset. And it's, it's so cool to see that. And, uh, and I, I believe that it, it makes HR really sexy. So if you, if you can show these people, then the non-HR guys start looking at them like, hey, uh, something is happening there. Yeah. And anyway, the cool thing is, all, all, all we're doing is we're, we're sort of, if you want, giving them the tools. I mean, you know, for me, it was always, I, I said it's culture change in a feature. This is, I mean, the, the, the example I just gave you, right? If, if I showed you in the, the tool that we've built. So you, you literally see how people work in a network. It's just a, a, a description of people, what, what people are working on. So you see Mike is working on something with Tony. It's a, the VR sales dive push. But the interesting thing. So if you, if you click, I want to make a contribution. Anybody in the company can start working on something. Right? I'm just working out my new touch screen. And they, they basically are empowered to start working on something. And now obviously my, because it's Windows, Windows has crashed. No, there it is. Uh, so any, anybody can start working, right? Now the only thing you have today is, okay, I, I want to make a contribution. What's the title? Of Reduce bureaucracy. Okay. And now what you have to do is you have to give it a priority. And you have to say, oh, does that relate to your organizational gold, silver or bronze priority? And then the HR guys go, well, what are the gold, silver, and bronze priority? And I'm like, I don't know. You have to tell me. What are your organizational priorities? They go, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, okay, so how does anybody work in the organization right now if they don't know what the priorities are? Well, they get told by their boss. Well, how do their bosses know it? All you have to do is you have to establish very clearly what the priorities are, whatever you want to call them. And then once you've established this and say, okay, so bureaucracy killing actually cost reduction right now is our, our number one in the in this current situation so it's gold the next thing you have to define is what we call definition of done explain how the paying customer will feel the success of this contribution this kills the hr people when i say tell me how the customer will experience that what you're doing in hr provides value and they go oh you mean our business partner and i'm like no the guy who comes into your shop and pays money so everybody gets paid in the company Oh, but we don't have anything to do with those people. You have everything to do with those people. Like this is your job literally is to empower that these people get the value, the services or the goods that you're building as a company competitively, right? And just those three simple features to go through them with HR guys and to say, can you name them? And then you have a year's worth of work. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, the, the good thing about that is that once it starts to being done, then, then the employees will be treated like adults, as you said. And also, they are not going to just be resourceful, but I know it's a cliche, but it, they, they're going to be happy. And kind of that's, uh, that's a nice yeah. part. But I think, and you said it in exactly the right order. I think for me, the, the thing I learned about working with and, and, and having experienced as a child, my dad working in a network organization, is that these companies, the network companies, they start from meaning, right? They say, if people believe in what we're doing, if they believe in the people next to them, and if they believe in the mission that the leadership has founded this company for, and we give them the autonomy to work as adults, they will be happy. They didn't say, we want to create a happy work environment. Um, they, they set out with a meaningful mission. And I think there's a really important distinction that this Happiness at work is a wrong goal, in my opinion. Right? Yeah, if, if you work for NASA or something, you know, there's life at stakes. You'll be super stressed out. Um, there's a, a lot of bureaucracy there. That, that, you know, and every time a shuttle goes up, you hope that they don't die on their way up. But you're probably happy because you, what you do is meaningful. It pushes the human race forward. Now, it doesn't always have to be space exploration. But if you believe in the purpose of what you're doing and the environment is such that you can bring your full self human being to work, it'll, the potential that you'll be more happy than not is higher. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's the way I think about it rather than striving for Absolutely. happiness. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. I just talked to Steve Rader, Rader from NASA, uh, you know, deputy director, and he, he was the, like the same. And you know, uh, the thing is, that's why I hate all these employer branding bullshits, you know, all these uh, nice things in the office, because if your work sucks, if you have a nice thing in your office, then who, who the fuck cares? This, and, 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 you know, I always I have this wonderful 
example, you know, the, the, the other tool that we've built is, is about feedback where you can give stars to a colleague, but you only have 10 stars per week. And the, the inspiration was Snoopy, that, that NASA actually had a program. I don't know if you've heard about this. It was called the Snoopy Award, no? So what they did was that they took, uh, I think it was 100 Snoopy pins, um, um, silver pins of, of, of Snoopy the Spaceman, who was their mascot, up in space. And then when they came back, the astronauts would hand a Snoopy pin to those employees of NASA who they felt made a big contribution to getting them into space and back safely. So they would literally hand it over with a, a medal and they would get the pin on their lapel. And you know that anything space related, weight is gold, right? You, you wanna be as light as possible. So taking a hundred pins up into space is crazy for them. It, it takes so much fuel, something else can't go. Um, so it's really valuable because there's only a hundred of them, um, which is why when they, the people got the awards, it's like the highest honor at NASA to get a silver Snoopy pin from an astronaut. And we said the same thing, right? We got inspired by that and said, at the end of the day, people want to feel that there's, there's a real recognition by their peers that what they did was valuable. But for that, you, you have to limit the resource. If it's like a Facebook like and you can just dish them out as many as you want, but you only have 10, 10 per week. So make sure they count because just like the NASA Snoopy pins, there's only so many going around. So I think there's a lot to learn from NASA. Absolutely. We have to stop, unfortunately, because uh, the Talking time too much. is over. And... No, no, it's, it was excellent, excellent. That's why I haven't st stopped because I was enjoying it. <laughs> Great to talk to you as usual. A lot of uh, interesting thoughts, uh, not the ordinary ones. Which, which is why we like you. So thank you very much. And uh, maybe we come back in a few months to see where we, we all this madness got. And what do you think uh, about the world, let's say in September or something like that? Huh? Hopefully in, in, in place in Budapest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that would be nice. We will have a beach party on the 3rd of September. Uh, don't, 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 don't jinx it. Don't, don't tease it yet. It's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that would be awesome. Thank okay. you very much for having me. Take care, Heiko. Nice to talk to you. Thank you.